Thank you very much. It's certainly an honor and a privilege to be at this event and with you here today. We hope to help out and give you some uh, good ideas of how to really solve some unsolved, previously solved processes in your facility. So as mentioned, Randy's here with me. I, in some ways, I represent like a manufacturer that's providing uh, component solutions. And Randy from uh, Cotter Brothers is here representing really the end user and the whole system of how an individual component solution will solve a whole system problem. But it's much more than just the components. You have to add other components to do that. So Randy, any comments, introductory comments you have? Well, I'd just like to say thank you. And, and we look forward to being able to go through the slides here and, and talk about real life situations and things we've been through in the past and going forward in the future. So to start, uh, really, how did our companies, like many of yours, get involved to see that the single-use technology is really uh, changing as a game changer? And for us, it started when uh, we were selling our pumps uh, in the industry, and they were getting bought over and over and over. And we asked, well, what's going on here? Do you really, are, are, are their pumps failing? Why, why is there such turnover? Well, then we asked, no, it's a single use. So this was many years ago. And then we said, no, this is an opportunity that we need to invest to provide a more ample solution to the processors out there. And I think, Randy, what, you, know, you, you, you got in there in a different way, I think. Well, yes, as far as single use, you know, we've always been a stainless steel conventional manufacturer of process systems. And for years and years, we've done multiple different systems between filtration, reactors, fermenters, chromatography. And then in the last 10 years, single use has been very, very popular. And we were against it in the beginning, but if you can't beat them, I guess you have to join them. So can't over beat the them. last number of years, we've done a number of single use systems. So if we look at uh, some of the recent uh, information out there, Aspen Brooks, some of you may know, they did a survey in 2013. So this is recent data on uh, you know, what's out there. And the use of single use in, in low is, a, is really a low barrier to entry. And this represents a serious, significant, untapped segment to provide solutions. And if we just provide the confidence and the technical backing for these processes, it'll unleash a lot of broader macro solutions. Uh, and if we look at the outcomes of today is we're going to enable new solutions. So first you need to understand what are the difficulties? What are the process priorities? What are the limitations? And are there solutions that solve it or not? And what we'll introduce today is there are solutions that are going to solve, solve process problems in flow transfer. We're talking about flow transfer and the biggest systems around it. And then we're going to talk about uh, how single-use pumps really float to the top to solve those problems. We're going to talk about how flow control is critical to solving these problems. It's not just transferring product from A to B, but what happens in between there? Are we doing inline buffer dilution? Are we doing, uh, you know, perfuse solutions? Are put together with companies like Cotter Brothers to provide a uh, complete solution. I don't know if you have any comments on that or not. So what are these fluid transfer priorities? One of them is up top is you got to just transfer from A to B. But that's the most elementary, right? Many pumps can do that. The question is, is do you need flow control? Do you need to accurately blend two different solutions together in the proper uh, ratios? Flow stability. If you're going through a filter system that can't withstand pulsation, you don't want to use a pump that pulsates. Okay? Uh, product shear. We're dealing with many of these processes with live cells. Do we really want to damage them? So is there right technology to solve those issues or not? So we'll analyze different technologies in that. And contamination. I think one of them that uh, Cotter Brothers has been specially good is offering solutions in scalability and turn down, if you have any comments on that. Well, there's a couple of things on here, and probably one of the main things that everyone forgets besides just the pump and having the control and, and to have the pressures and flows is back pressure control, which every pump needs just about on every system. So it's important to be able to look at what the system is, what the 
proper pump is and to make sure it's applied properly. Yeah, so again, it's not just an individual device, but it's the combination of them. In this case, back pressure control to make the pump work in a stable fashion. Absolutely. So as we look at processes like a monoclonal antibody process where single-use pumps are needed, there's many areas where pumps are applied differently. In some areas, it might be a peristaltic pump that might be the right way. Another one might be a uh, quattro flow pump, quaternary diaphragm pump. Another one might be a piston or lobe. So we'll, as you analyze each one of those, you'll see what's important. So, for example, if you're looking... What are some of the key aspects that we talked earlier? You got heat input, particle generation, pulsation, pressure, flow rate, turndown. So in a bioreactor, you may need to have proper flow rate for dosing so the feedstock or something like that. So that's important. Now, if you're talking about buffer product transfer, maybe you want to avoid particle generation. So does the fluid transfer technology really help with that or not? Virus filtration. Here's a case that you're adding more uh, requirements. No pulsation's key uh, to guarantee you don't get any particulates going past the, the, the virus filter. So then that starts to limit what your options are in pumps. Chromatography systems. Then you got turndown rate issues. Okay? You got linear pump characteristics and so on. And tangential flow filters. Then you add a whole slew. So Randy, what, what are some of the uh, skids that you have made, your company has supplied to the industry, and, and what have been some of the more de demanding requirements? In the last few years, quattro flow and diaph uh, diaphragm pumps have been real popular in the TFF and chromatography systems where maybe rotary lobes were the most popular choice. And there have been issues with those where we've actually taken systems previously built and put quattro flow you know, diaphragm pumps in there because they had issues with, with galling. They wanted larger turndown ratios. So we've actually retrofitted existing systems to go with these, these newer style diaphragm pumps. Yeah, I think you uh, highlight why we're here today. You know, if there's a technology that was used 30 years ago, is it really the current one today? So the idea is to open the mind to see what are the new options and they may or may not solve. In the case here of high turndown, certain technologies can do that. So as we start reviewing, let's review different pump technologies, see where they fit and where, where, they, uh, where other options might be here. Of course, one of the more traditional pumps in the uh, industry has been the peristaltic pump. Uh, certainly the workhorse of the industry. Uh, it's nice flexibility having just the tube use. But then you've got to look, you know, where is it used? So in, in, in areas where pulsation is not really a factor, then that's probably a good choice. Uh, and, you know, where you don't need a lot of linearity or turndown, perhaps that's a good choice. And one of the things that's, uh, what, this is just not talking basics. Look at the pump curves. Really, the pump curve, if, if, if you need assistance from pump specialists, that'll tell you what the pump is able to do. You will see from the pump curve whether it keeps constant flow with changes in pressure or if it has a high turndown. So that's a key area. If you need uh, always some backing, technical backing for the work you're doing, compare uh, performance curves and have those explained to you to really document what you're doing. I don't know if you have any comments on uh, uses of peristaltic pumps. So, they, they have their applications. yeah, so they have their applications. Now, the other uh, uh, technology that's out there is centrifugal pumps. Uh, tr centrifugal pumps are nice because, you know, you could deadhead a centrifugal pump, and that means you could close a valve, and it's not going to rupture the tubing or filter, perhaps, if it's sized correctly. So there are certain applications where low viscosity, uh, of course, water loops are famous. You know, you use uh, centrifugal pumps for water loops for very obvious reasons. Um, uh, only recently is, you know, there are not a lot of options for single-use centrifugal pumps. But you keep that in mind when those are required. Uh, one thing I will tell you about centrifugal pumps is look at the curves again. And one thing you'll notice here is that 
you can get a large variance in flow rate with hardly any change in pressure. So if you need constant flow with changes in pressure in your system, you need to really make sure you've got the proper automation and controls to make this work. Uh, Randy, in your system work, what's been your experience with centrifugals? The most popular application we see with those is, is in CIP, which is on the cleaning side, and you'll see them also use back pressure control. You'll see them as in the WIFI systems, which use back pressure control. And like Wallace was saying, that's where you, you get your pressure with the dynamic of flow. Yeah, so, I mean, the flexibility in a CIP recirculation system, you just need, you need flow, you need to keep that current, but precision is not that critical. So, really, we're going between two technologies. We went from a positive displacement pump technology to a centrifugal. Now let's go back to a positive displacement technology, low pumps that you may be familiar with, that's really designed to have more linear flow. You know, these te this technology has been uh, available a long time, and really, what, what is a positive displacement pump is if you look at the curve there should be a direct relationship between the speed you run the pump and the flow rate you achieve and that's actually uh, within higher viscosity products certainly a low pump uh, does that okay I don't know if you have any comments on low pumps so historically for years these have been used on process skids such as chromatography and filtration and they've been there because they had the turn down of 10 to 1. Now with the use of the diaphragm pumps, the quadruple flow, we're able to get 80 to 1 to sometimes 100 to 1 turn down in the same application. Yeah, so all about that scalability, turn down ability. And one thing I'd, I'd add is on a low pump, when you're running uh, low viscosity products, uh, you know, the slip tends to go up, so then you have to account for that in the pump speed. So you can adapt control system to do that and back pressure valves. But you lose some of your turn down, so you, the first uh, lower RPMs of the pump are not usable. Now that may be okay in some cases, in some cases not. So that has to be uh, analyzed. In this case, this is saying that the pump can operate at any point here, and uh, will this be the correct point or not? So one of the new technologies out in the field is the quaternary diaphragm pump. It's basically a technology. It's a positive displacement technology, but what it does is it's a pump that has very low slip in even low viscosity products, aqueous solutions, cell structures, and so on. In fact, we see the, the pump curve uh, here. Okay? So you'll notice here a couple things here on this pump curve is that you get very high turndown. You can run this pump, in this case, to pumping literally a liter per hour to over 150 liters per hour with the same pump. Also notice that the different color lines is even with changes in pressure, these lines are very similar. So theoretically, the pump will pump the same regardless of the change in conditions of pressure, which differs a bit from this pump. You see how wide that range is? Now, if it's a critical process that needs very precise flow, you really need to have that narrow band. And uh, you've installed this in quite a few uh, applications where this uh, was a solution. Correct. And I believe this, this quarter flow pump was originally designed in blood fractionation. Isn't that correct? Yeah, blood fractionation. Uh, it was original, one of the original aspects of it because uh, you got, you know, delicate cells. And this is a very low shear pump technology to do that. But then the other catalyst was this was in the filtration, the tangential flow filters, in which you need to have the correct velocity of product across the, uh, the filter as to have the proper uh, performance occur. So this really was born out of a need, absolutely. And I think uh, the Cotter Brothers has taken that to many other application solutions, and especially in turndown, I understand. Correct. We, we just delivered a number of skids, uh, even overseas, and not just the United States, where we've used these in filtration and chromatography, and, and we've replaced not just the rotary load pumps, but also the other diaphragm pumps that are in the industry uh, because of the performance and, and the uh, usability of this pump. Yeah. So one, one thing to note is the low pump 
Uh, of course, it's been used, but it's actually not yet a, a developed a version that's single use. So I, I think we need to make that out here. Also, okay, what technologies are really single use? So if we go back to the peristolic, that is a single use pump, right? Several options out there. You've got the centrifugal pump uh, technology. There's one option out there. The rest are non-single use. Then you've got the low pumps. None of them are single use. So if you have to go single use, this kind of already eliminates the solutions that this pump can offer. And then the quaternary diaphragm pump is actually unique in that it's a convertible technology. You can either put a single use head or you can put a multi-use head. So let's say if you're a CMO contract manufacturer and you're doing a very small batch and that's all you're going to do, you can use a single use head. Or if you're doing a uh, constant application, you have the CIP sterilization system do it, you can put a permanent head. So I think the, the, the uh, processors and integrators like you need to look for solutions that, that like that going forward, you know, with flexibility in mind. Well, an another great point, which is, is the maintenance factor of these, and the, to do that change over either from single use or in your conventional head that can be steamed in SIP, is, is the maintenance of, of the elastomers that are behind that, that cover. And that could be changed with four quick bolts, and four quick bolts to put it back together, probably 15 minute change, where in the other pumps, you need more than one tool and a, and a lot more time to, to make that service. Yeah, and it's really a, a sign of the evolving industry. In, in the case of uh, the biotechnology area, where you're going from R&D processes to developing new drugs and s solutions there, is there's a lot more flexibility that's needed than the general industry where some of these other technologies were developed for. And But having that switch back and forth is, uh, is handy, absolutely. So... As, as we go here, what else is going on in the industry? And we've seen this in the last four years is a lot of the places where these pumps were going were R&D for new, for new drugs, okay, new solutions. So as of 2014, our company personally is seeing that we're seeing a lot of these products go to commercial uh, scale. So scale up is key. In other words, if you develop something in a very small flow rate, you want to make sure you're doing the same thing at a higher flow rate. So scale up is a key factor. And fortunately, uh, there are technologies that are you know, better for scale up than others. And QuattroFlow happens to be, the quaternary diaphragm, happens to have high scale up capability. Uh, we see here, for example, the, this particular smallest size pump, you can go almost to no flow, very small dispensing cases, but all the way up to 150, so you know, more than 30 to 1 uh, turndown. But then if you need to scale up to more production, go up to the next size up, and there we go from almost uh, nothing again to close to uh, 1,200 liters per hour. Very wide gap, a very wide range of flows for scale up. And it's really essentially the same technology, the same shear rates that are produced, so very scalable. What have you seen uh, regarding scale up and, and, and going up, Randy? So with these pumps in particular, we've had clients where we've done very small scale systems in, in small fractional sizes, quarter and three eighths, and they have had their product go to the next next level of, of, of processing and have used the next style up even up to these 4400s to achieve those ranges and that flow for that scale up and it's it's real life yeah and and, and uh, i'd like to comment we have this next size uh, up that's available in the market and it was actually uh you know thanks to processors and uh integrators like uh, cotter brothers here in the in the u.s we we made this for a specific customer a uh, larger scale version of this technology, and it turns out the demand is we've blown uh, the demand's been uh, surpassed our expectations. This is one of our uh, large sellers now at the twenty thousand liter per hour. So a really nice, uh, nice solution. Very all the way down from one liter hour to twenty thousand liters an hour. A lot of scale up capability. I think we're driving that point home pretty well. <laughs> so. That's kind of the, the uh, uh, brief uh, theoretical thought. Where let's show us some examples of 
of solutions where this is. But, but I would like to extend just a little bit in this interim if there's any questions in the audience regarding some of these graphs, some of these needs. Uh, you know, I know our time's short, but any, I, I entertain any questions regarding some of these different technologies. Or another one, maybe we didn't talk about uh, vein pumps, but of course they're not a biotech pump. So any other technologies that you have questions on? All right. So inline buffer, that's a key need where you need good flow control, right? Uh, because you're adding different flows, different phases all at the same time. So if you have an on-demand buffer system, it needs to be ratioed properly and it needs to be accurate and repeatable. So having a pump that is able to have the high and low flow ranges and proportion them correctly real time is a key enabling. So this pump enables. Now you can have this type of uh, solution on your buffer delivery that before was not possible. So this is how we tie together the technology and the solution. And, and you guys are familiar with uh, inline uh, buffer dilution as well, aren't you? Yeah, so what's, what's a plus of using these pumps, especially in this application, is their controllability and how fast you can have a system commissioned and turned on and get it to, through validation and start making products. So that's a plus on that side. Good. So uh, membrane filtration, we talked a little bit about that, how uh, not having a pulsing pump is critical because you have to validate that that viral filter, there's nothing passing through the filter and that's done through controlled flow and making sure you're not exceeding the pressure capabilities of that filter. So a critical need for uh, this kind of solution. Pump control. Pump control. So we're, a common theme here that, that we're seeing, pump controls more than just moving. Bioreactors. And, you know, of course, you, you have all of these companies that are in this uh, great uh, venue here of Interfex 2014 are here. So this is something that you can then walk the show and see in person and talk to these vendors uh, uh, yourselves to understand this. But uh, here's uh, more examples of where they use in the bioreactor usage. Okay. We see some pumps that are used here. Like, for example, in this case, a peristolic pump is probably going to be the right solution. Yeah. So Randy agrees with that. <laughs> yeah, so conventionally you would see, as you can see in the photos, more peristaltic pump use because of the tubing and, and the flexibility of those, and it's a, not a very wide range of, of use for that. So, so that's where that would be at. Good. So harvest to clarification. Now that becomes a little more uh, uh, critical in some cases, in some cases not. So now this offers flexibility to uh, the processor that in some cases he may use uh, either one of two types of pumps or depends on what the details of that filtration process is or that clarification. Now as we go to more uh, sophisticated systems, chromatopter, capture polish, you know, filling the columns and then running the process, uh, then you're starting to talk about having low flows, high flows, um, you know, the com Convertibility. I don't know, you, you have a lot of experience with uh, these systems, Randy. What are your comments? And also, like we were saying earlier, this, this is where the pulsation is critical. These, in these final steps in these columns, they're, they're very sensitive to the pulsation and, of course, air and all those, those bad things. And, and that's why we'll use this, this diaphragm pipe in this application. Yeah, so, so some pumps that don't have that are, are key. I mean, some of the most expensive uh, media are found in this type of situation. So, and this company is also here at the at the at the boot at the show. Uh, another virus filtration. We covered that a little bit. Um, some ultra filtration processes. Dye filtration. Filtration is a critical one because it just requires very precise flow characteristics, and that's where you can dial down uh, with certain technologies. So. Those are, those are examples of, of solutions here, but there are more out there. You know, dispensing cases where you need to accurately dispense. You know, what kind of pump is ideal for that? Probably a peristolic in many cases, but in some cases you can need another thing. Randy, what other uh, processes would you uh, talk well, about? In these, in these UFDF systems, 
you'll need that turned down with this pump because you'll start with a, a higher quantity of fluid, whether you start with 1,000 liters or a few hundred liters, you'll concentrate down to three to five, and that's where the flow rate is very critical as you concentrate down to be able to have that control and be able to use the same pump to go from that higher flow down to that lower flow. So flow control, we hear that theme a lot. And so uh, if, if there's one takeaway uh, today from this is, is think about that. Pumps are not just to move from A to B. There's the other factors, flow control. PSG, where innovation flows.